description. All right. Um, so our James had to step out into another meeting. So Bill and Robert are going to be presenting. Um, you can ask questions as you think of them. You can ask questions at the end of their section or at the very end, however you prefer. Um, like I have been saying, we're allowing you to control your own mic, control your own camera, unless you're eating or having a group chat, then we'll meet you. <laughs> so, Bill, Robert, do you want to say anything to start with? Or, Bill, do you want to? We just uh, move right into it. Okay, I'm good with that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. And uh, start off with just a few changes that uh, take place uh, for the 23-24 year with the Promise and Reconnect programs. Uh, Joe, you want to? Yeah. So um, as James mentioned earlier, these were changes that were made last year and we thought would go into effect uh, for the summer of 23, but uh, the rules were not approved by the AG's office until recently. So these are changes that will take effect for the uh, there's in effect for the 23-24 year. And we're going to start off with the uh, enrollment ex exceptions. And most of these are the same. They've been in effect since the beginning, uh, but we're going to go over them again just for uh, clarity. So for 23-24, students uh, may receive a promise award for less than full-time enrollment and participation in the following situations. Uh, first of all, if the program of study mandates a less than a full-time in a given semester, uh, then obviously then that's going to be an approved situation where they do not have to take uh, 12 hours in order to be paid promise. If uh, if they're in the last semester before they graduate or complete their program of study, then that would be approved also. Uh, if they only have two or three classes left and obviously we don't want to make them take uh, 12 hours that last semester. So that would be an approved exception for the for the 12 hour requirement. Uh, so course offerings in a given semester uh, where a student may not be able to take uh, all the classes that they lack, maybe some of only a couple of them are offered. You know, that's obviously beyond the student's control and that would be an approved exception to the uh, full time requirement. And this this one is the one that is new. So a student who uh, wants to take just a couple of classes in the summer to either get ahead or maybe catch up, then they can now do that and be paid promise for the summer for less than 12 hours. So in the past, they were allowed to enroll for less than 12 and not affect their eligibility going forward. But they were not able to be paid unless they were 12 hours. So going forward. They can enroll summer at less than full time and be paid. No documentation, no appeal necessary. It's just approved for summer. And then as always, other exceptions can be considered on a case by case by the IRP. Uh, health issues for the student or for family or maybe a death in the family or uh, whatever the case, those would be considered by the I IRP on a case by case. So, for all these given exceptions, the institution should be developing their own policy to uh, to allow students to uh, take advantage of those exceptions and not require an appeal to the IRP, except the last one, of course. Uh, and then again, no documentation is needed for the summer semester. Any questions on any of that? Bill, we did have one question from Rita Allison. Okay. Just for clar just for clarification, will TSAC be monitoring the five semester timeline for Tennessee Promise if students have the less than full time exception? We will still be monitoring the five semesters, but those semesters will not count in against their five. I failed to mention that. Thank you. 
so if they go in the summer and they don't don't take a uh, full time, then that would not count against them. Good question. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, one more question that sure. I failed to mention. <laughs> uh, will the handout be provided at the end? So we are recording this and recording the transcript. It will be uploaded to the website where the other um, recordings are on the trainings. And we will send out the link via fast announcements when that gets ready. Okay. So we're good after that. Okay. So just one more comment on the five semesters. Um, you know, this is just really to help out the students. Uh, if the student who wants to take a few during the summer to get ahead or catch up and uh, not counting against their five semester limit, then then that gives them, um, you know, a full semester later on. And then the, the. Course program of study would, um, you know, keep them from taking advantage of that, but that would give them, you know, a little extra flexibility that hopefully would be helpful to them in the long run. Any other questions on this part? All right, we're going to go to the next screen. Um, so uh, FAST was uh, updated with these exceptions and that went into effect last week. Um, so the five semester limit um, exceptions are, are now working in FAST for next summer. Um, all right, next screen. All right, and one other thing we just want to make you aware of, um, Ayers, the, one of the, our partnering organizations, uh, took over a few extra counties. Uh, I say a few, but it about doubled their their number. Uh, but this goes into effect next fall. It's in effect now in FAST, but it's for students for 24, 25 year. Those students who are now applying for Tennessee Promise. Uh, so uh, up until now, they just had Benton, uh, Claiborne, Decatur, Hardin, Haywood, Henderson, Lawrence, Lewis, Perry, Unicoi, Union, and Wayne. I feel like the Snowbird Report. Um, but uh, so for 24-25, they did uh, assume the, the counties that have new beside them, the Bledsoe Cam County, Campbell County, Cock County, Houston, Lauderdale, McNary, Meigs, Scott, Warren, uh, so just to make you aware uh, that you may be seeing students, if you have students from those counties, um, that may change who you see emails coming from, uh, dealing with uh, maybe community service hours or things like that, and then also would change who you need to send emails to. But you're always welcome to just email us. A lot of you email the, the, the PO and copy us, and that's fine. Uh, but you may have to check a few students uh, to make sure that you're emailing the, the correct uh, PO. Uh, so that's going to make a, um, an interesting next year or so when we have um, students in those counties who are existing. Um, achieves students and you'll have new students next year who may who will be under Ayers. So um, you can check that by the cohort year uh, in FAST. Also, each individual, individual student, you can go into their promise record and about midway down, it'll tell you who the PO is. Uh, any questions on any of that? So just to make you aware, um, some of the uh, Ayers staff, uh, Mike Meadows, uh, Taylor, what's Taylor's last name? Joe? Deal, D-I-L-L. -L. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so you might be seeing emails from them when you haven't been accustomed to, to seeing that. All right, if there's no questions, we'll move on. Uh, the next screen is for the reconnect. It's pretty much the same uh, exception. 
um, as it was for Promise. So uh, for the 23-24 year, students can receive a reconnect award for less than part-time enrollment. Uh, for the same uh, exceptions, uh, semester of graduation, before graduation, any semester where the institution doesn't offer uh, part-time hours, or um, their declared program of study requires less than part-time for that semester. Uh, and then the summer semester now, they can go below half-time, which is the change uh, in all this for reconnect. Um, it will count in their five years, though. That's the difference between promise and reconnect. That's still that half, that less than half-time semester will count in their five years. So they need to uh, account for that in planning out the next, the remaining semesters. And then of course, any exceptions that are considered by the IRP. And again, the institution should be developing policies uh, so that the students uh, can take advantage of these exceptions without having to uh, submit an appeal to the IRP. And no documentation is needed for the summer semester. Any questions on that from anyone? You're welcome to unmute and ask any questions you have. There is nothing in the chat at the moment. All right, it's pretty straightforward. And again, you know, we mentioned hey, this Bill. last year thinking that, hey, got a question I'll, from Reed. Yeah. Yes, uh, I will usually have a question. Um, you stated something about developing in your policy something about them not needing to submit an appeal to IRP. Could you state a little yeah. bit more what you're needing it so that we can you know, sure. document these exceptions? Sure. Any anything on the screen there? Um, you know, again, all these except the summer have already been in place. Um, so any of those um, that are on the screen or, or uh, you should be developing policy so that the student doesn't have to file an appeal for, you know, their their graduation semester or uh, you know, something like that. You're going to have to document it, um, you know, especially um, let's say a student only has a couple of classes they can take left and they're not all offered that semester. You may need something from, uh, you know, different parts of campus to document your your account, but um, the student shouldn't necessarily have to file an appeal for that. Uh, so other than the last uh, bullet there where they're um, kind of odd cases that have to go to the IRP, those top ones that are more common and, and you know, in the, the rule, um, hopefully, you know, for the school's sake and, and the student's sake, um, we don't want them to have to file an appeal if they don't have to. And that last part is what you're emphasizing the go to the IRP, correct? So we could have yeah. our own documentation processes in place, but we just don't necessarily need the IRP involved. Right, for those top ones, exactly. That makes sense. I'll add a quick note for Reed. Yes, thanks. Um, Reed, I, I do like an appeal form for if they, you know, non-continuous enrollment, they has to go but to the IRP. I do an appeal form, but just for my documentation and things to keep myself in track case the auditor comes, I do an appeal for the exceptions. Like if it's a semester to graduate, like my degree works has to say 100% or I have to have a letter from the nursing or OTA or PTA or something as far as that goes, show so it's proof so they can't come back and say, well, I got to end up, you know, taking another semester. Well, no, we approved you because you're going to graduate. You know, I have 100%. You've met all your um, requirements. You're done. So it's still for my basis for the exceptions. I still make them fill out something just to cover my basis. Yeah, I mean, we do that too. I just think probably from a logistic standpoint, we'll have two different types of appeal forms since we use dynamic forms and it kind of can have an automated routing process so that it's not needing to go to an appeal committee. It can just go and to the necessary person to provide documentation and then to our office. But we have, you know, those specific situations we limit it to. Okay, gotcha. 
Okay. Yeah, well, that and sounds we, good. You definitely want to, to document when Leah comes to visit. <laughs> we do have a few comments. Um, so Brian Douglas asked, for those that are not reading the comments, the reconnect only counts against the five semesters if the student is paid an amount greater than zero, correct? James is still, it's, James is still it's, looking. He answered it. He's like, no, in Tennessee reconnect, there are no exceptions to the five-year limit similar to that in Tennessee Promise. So, now, the first semester, if they're paid, if they're paid zero, then that doesn't start the clock. Okay. But once they are paid an actual payment, then your five years starts and any semester after that, after that, whether they're paid or not, it counts in the five years. Unless there's an, um, a leave of absence or, or something like that that's taken out of it later. So for Tennessee Reconnect, is there a five year limit? There's not like the promise, correct? Five years for Reconnect, five semesters for, for promise. Gotcha. OK, that was the difference. Um, Jonathan Graham asked, if the summer term will not count toward one of the five semesters of eligibility for a part-time summer Tennessee Promise student, will a student still be required to submit eight hours of community service for the summer term if enrolled part-time? James did answer that one as well and said yes. To receive the payment, eight hours is required. To receive the payment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marion asks, does the part-time semester count as a full semester toward the limit, or will that count as a partial semester? That would be, Marion, no. are you talking about promise and reconnect both? I think you've already answered that question. On the Tennessee okay. reconnect, it's a five-year limit and the clock starts. Once the student receives a payment, unless there's a leave of absence exception that's been approved. Okay. Correct. And there are no partial. Partial it's credit. Just, it's just the five years. Period. So we are we're good unless somebody else has a question that's not in chat. Okay. I just can I? Sorry, this is uh, Kelsa at Northeast State. Quick question on Promise. Sure. I guess I know the answer. I just want to ask it anyway. So a student could theoretically never actually use a semester of Promise if they get a memo from an advisor that they can't be full time any semester, right? I mean, I'm just I don't know that that would happen, but it could. Would you well, agree? Well, it's, it's just the summer. That's that's not counting against them. So if they're in just in, if they meet one of the other exceptions in like a fall or spring semester where they're maybe just in nine hours. Yes, that is still counting towards the five semester limit. Correct. Oh, excuse me. OK, OK, thank you for that. Sure. Anyone else? All right, there's our information. Um, Give us a call if you have a question or email us. I'd like to add that James loves phone calls. So <laughs> there's his number. Feel free to call him anytime. <laughs> he doesn't like phone calls, by the way, but <laughs> he will return your call. <laughs> How did that get in there? <laughs> <laughs> Can you go back to the first slide? Okay. Kimberly Pierce. Is that the one you need to see? We will also be sending out the PowerPoint after um, after we're finished in the recording link as well. Okay. Robert, this, is Betty. Gonna... this is Betty at Northeast State. I have a yes, question about ahead. that first slide. Okay. Okay, so it's confusing because it says attendance under one of these exceptions will not count towards the five semester limit. So it doesn't say just summer. It says any of those exceptions under one of these exceptions. So that is confusing because it sounds like if their program of study only requires part time, 
then it won't count against their five semester limit for any term. It doesn't specify summer in that sentence. You are correct. That's exactly why I wanted to see that slide again, because yeah. the that is very, so only summer uh, less than full-time enrollment doesn't count or any, any less than full-time enrollment doesn't count. It was my understanding it was summer, but I will double check with uh, James and I will uh, send out something this afternoon, I hope. I'm asking, so maybe we can get a clearance before we get off the call. We'll see. Good deal. Okay. okay. Move right into the uh, I hope scholarship program. I know it says Tennessee Education Lodge Scholarship. Let's move on to the next slide, uh, Joe, please. Um, so as as you see uh, the exceptions there, beginning um, with uh, November the 5th, of this academic year, um, students who were previously not eligible to receive Hope Scholarship funds because they were enrolled in fewer than six hours may now qualify for uh, an award, but only under one of these three conditions. You see the three conditions uh, there. So if a student is in the last semester of their graduation, that could be an associate's degree, that could be a, a baccalaureate degree or an advanced degree, and they are uh, enrolled in less than six hours required of that program, that student may receive funding. Uh, let me back up and say that I have received a number of questions regarding enroll less than six hours. Why is that? Because there is a form out there on the uh, in FAST that describes the award amounts, the prorated award amounts for these students. And many of you have asked about them through email, through phone calls. Some of you, both phone calls and email. Robert, when is this going to take effect? That was over a year ago. Uh, we're talking about it now because effective November the 5th, you guys can uh, start to award these students beginning with the fall 2023 semester. So if you have a student that's in the final semester of their graduation this semester, fall 2023, and they are enrolled in less than six hours required of their CTOS, then you guys can, can award them. Can't go back. To and pay retroactively, but beginning with fall 2023, you can. You can. So if a, the student's under the second condition, any semester in which the institution does not offer at least six hours uh, of CPOS courses, that student may receive uh, funding for less than six hours. And finally, the student's uh, CPOS required less than six hours for that semester. Uh, so these are the three conditions. So many of you who have noticed the document, and I'm going to hold it up. Uh, it was at the, and I don't know if you can see that clearly, but this document is at the help link in FAST, and many of you have started to identify students uh, and uh, are planning to uh, award these students. So beginning November 5th, uh, you'll be able to do that. You won't see functionality in the certification roster yet. I'm still testing uh, those items out in in the test environment, uh, but soon after testing and everything uh, cl is cleared uh, with regards to, to testing those items, we will push them to to production and make you guys aware. We'll send you an, an email through fast announcement to let you know it's out there so that you guys can begin uh, uh, certification. Do we have a question? We do. Um, okay. The question is, will there be banner changes to allow awards to pay for less than six hours? Um, and that's from Kimberly Pierce. TSAC does not determine banner changes, so that would be up to TBR or your individual or institution. Your institution. That's correct. Yeah, very good question. I thought I saw a, a question come up. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so certification. So if you, you're performing a manual certification, uh, here are the steps. 
We don't have a specific indicator, so we're going to borrow an indicator, an existing indicator. It's called over award reduced. So select that indicator when you plan to award a student uh, fewer than six semester hours. Then for the enrollment status, you want to click or select less than part time. Now, the third bullet is kind of misleading, it's not entirely accurate. Uh, the system will auto populate to the one quarter award amount, but you can make adjustments to that. You just can't adjust up beyond that one quarter of a hope, full hope award amount. You can reduce it, but you can't increase it. So it will uh, uh, populate uh, based on the award amount that will be displayed in the uh, award rules interface. You see the upload download. Uh, process there, uh, and you select the letter that represents the overward reduced, select the letter that represents the less than part time, and, and uh, you will uh, be able to enter the, uh, the one quarter of a full hope amount uh, in the appropriate field for certification. Uh, any questions before we move on? And none. I think Being the final. In chat, if somebody wants to unmute and ask, they are welcome to. Okay. I think I have two slides left. Uh, I will say this that there are no changes to these two indicators. They're, they remain in there for your use. So there are going to be students that meet none of those three conditions. If they don't meet any of those three conditions and they are, they are enrolled in fewer than six hours, they are ineligible for funding. Uh, and so you would want to select full-time to part-time, the less than part-time or less than part-time certification indicator. So uh, the last slide is to make you aware that uh, uh, we'll send an at a fast announcement uh, with the training materials and more information about the uh, certification for less than, than part time. Uh, Josh Moran may be on the, the call, but there is a video uh, that we will send to the financial aid community. Uh, you can view the video and, and in his video, he'll walk you step by step how to use the certification indicator for not only students who are being certified for payment, while enrolled in fewer than six hours, but also for the advanced degree uh, certification indicator. We will push all of that to the production site around the same time. So I believe that concludes my presentation. Any any questions that anyone have for the Hope uh, Tennessee Reconnect or Promise? Robert, this is Stephen MTSU. Um, okay. We have maybe 10 or so uh, that we can certify for tells for advanced degrees this fall. And so we'll be doing so once we get guidance. But aside from that, just clarification, when we're doing a uh, certification for payment, half time for us means six to eight hours, part time is six to 11 hours. So we know a full time HOPE student at census cannot drop below full time. But else, if they are in six to 11, and using the terminology of part time, <laughs> uh, they cannot drop below half time. But That's when right. we're certifying a six to eight hour student, half time, are we using HT or are we using PT? You're using PT inside of the FAST system, you're using PT. Thank you. Uh, you bring up a good point uh, uh, that I, I thought you were going, and that is for advanced degree, we honor your grading policy, not uh, your your enrollment uh, level or classification with regards to advanced degree. So if you have if nine hours is considered full time for your advanced degree students, then you can pay full time post. You just certify full time. Yes, sir. Thank you. We understand okay. that part, though. That, I mean, good clarification. 
Robert, we question? do have a question in the chat from Dusty Paulson. If a student is trying to get into the nursing program and only has one three hour class left in a semester before they can apply to the program to get accepted, can they be paid at less than part time? Let's go back to that second slide. Yes, that one. Dusty, will that student fit in any one of those three categories? So they are technically in our Associate of Science Health Science degree, AS Health Science degree, um, until they get accepted into our nursing program. So technically, if they're in that degree, they have other classes they could take, but since they don't need it to get into nursing, they don't tend to take the other classes listed in their degree program. Um, I think there might be an exception in the promise or something for that. I'd have yeah, to to I, I, I was. I, I wanted to go back to this slide, Dusty, so that uh, we can see your example and wh whether they fall under one of those three conditions. I would say in that case, probably not. Uh, I mean, generally, no, you because, could, yeah. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that student wouldn't, um, would be ineligible for future funding. Oh, right, uh, no, I yeah. would, well, now I can put them as less than half, or less than part-time in FAST for certification, whereas before it was appeal pending, so that way they'll yeah. pop up on my roster the next semester. Yeah. But it was like, yeah. with these exceptions, they didn't quite fit with the way I was reading them in any one of these three exceptions, but I wanted to check yeah. where I understood that correctly. Well, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking. Uh, I, I regret to say that this student would not qualify under these either of these three conditions. Okay, I didn't think so, but I wanted to get clarification. Hey, Robert, this is Leanne from um, MTSU. We have a similar nursing program and they have to have candidacy to get into that program. So sometimes they've taken, they only have three hours and they can't take anything else until they get candidacy. So they are locked into that CPOS. So that would be an exception in th that would be approved in this case because they can't take any of the other classes until they're admitted. And so they only have that one CPOS eligible class they can take. Yes, under number two, I, at least I'm hearing you describe number two. Well, I mean, they, okay. Well, they are just locked in and that they don't have any other option. The school offers lots of classes, but they just don't have anything else they're offered to take. So that's how I read number two. I would read number two that way because those courses are applicable to, this, the, to the student's college program of study. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. Well, can you explain to me number three again, that only CPOS, can you help me understand that scenario? So a student who is, uh, well, let me read it. The student's college program study requires enrollment in less than six hours for a semester. So uh, let's say the student is uh, in one of your, your programs and it, is, it only requires the maximum amount of of six hours or less, or less than six hours uh, to participate in that semester, then I would say that that student can qualify for uh, Hope Scholarship funding at a quarter award amount. So uh, uh, there will be some knowledge there about the uh, the program and the program, the program limits the student to fewer than six hours. And that can be in any semester. That could be back-to-back -back semester that could be uh, uh, for the entire program now i don't know of any program that, that that's actually like that but if the, uh, the the program requires fewer than six hours of enrollment thank you uh, then 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 that student can qualify for a quarter of a full-time hope award amount i appreciate that thank you Welcome. We've got a few comments, but one relating to what we're talking about now. 
What about students who are approved for reduced hours due to a documented disability? We're talking about the less than six hours. Hmm. I don't, don't believe so, not under these three exceptions. Um, documented disability would allow a student to remain eligible, but not for funding. Um, the comment here, the FAST announcement that was sent out on Monday, October 2nd, that was yesterday. Yes. Um, no. Did not get sent out. Y'all stop it, freaking out. Okay. It, no. Uh, <laughs> thanks for pouring that out. I meant to, to, to mention that. We decided to delay it simply because we discovered a bug in testing. And it was with the anticipation that we would submit uh, the announcement uh, yesterday, but we weren't able to, and, and quite frankly, we failed to update this slot. But we plan to send that out uh, very soon. Once uh, testing is fully complete, we'll send it out, uh, the announcement out. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the announcement would also contain a link to the uh, videos that, that Josh has prepared. Y'all haven't missed anything yet. You're still good. Um, James has hopped back in and answered the the promise question. Part-time semesters wouldn't count against the five in Tennessee promise. So that would be any semester, not just summer. Is that how you read that, Bill? Yes. So my apology for that. This is all new to us all. So it sounds like any semester that's approved, one of those exceptions would not count against the five. Thank you. Um, Robert Dusty has come back. If a student is enrolled half time, six to eight hours, do we use the half time marker or part time marker? Sorry, I missed that question answer earlier. Yes, part time. Sorry, no, no, uh, Stephen, um, I believe I told Stephen part-time. Um, part-time is nine to 11 hour. Please just got my apology. Yes, six to eight hours is half-time. So going back to the part-time semesters counting against the five years, for hope, Robert, if they're part time, does it count against the five years? That's what they're asking as well. So for Hope, five years is five years, correct? Yes, five years is five years. Uh, but um, that's the way the system, the FAST system is going to calculate it. Um, I'm willing to work with you guys when a student is enrolled in halftime uh, and they have uh, or enrolled in semester but miss a, 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 another semester within the academic year due to leave of absence. Um, I know that's kind of different than this scenario that's being asked, uh, but the system will calculate uh, a, a semester versus two semesters within a year as one year. I'm willing to work with you. Student enrolled in three quarter time is that that is part of the academic year. So five years is five years. So what I'm hearing is it's a case by case basis. Correct. They just only, need to contact you. Only only when the student is not enrolled for at least one semester in an academic year. Okay. The system will calculate it as one full year. I can okay. then work with the institution to back that one semester out, reestablish the student's eligibility so the institution can certify for one semester. Robert, I have a question that's kind of similar to that. Um, 
I've noticed before in FAFSA, let's say somebody doesn't do a FAFSA one year and they're not, they're not enrolled, they don't do anything. I think FAST will think that that year kind of goes away. So I don't know if I'm explaining this very well. It looks like it'll give them a whole extra year when maybe they aren't due an extra year sometimes. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because they didn't do the FAFSA. So if a student was paid in year one, did not mm -hmm. submit a FAFSA application in year two, mm -hmm. then submit an application in year three. Yes. Uh, is that, that's the scenario that you're referring yes. to, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the system uh, will calculate um, eligibility on that second year. Mm -hmm. Um, so like would it show them as eligible when really they shouldn't be because they weren't enrolled? Yeah, the, well, the system doesn't know whether or not a student is enrolled mm -hmm. uh, for a year until the uh, a system user of the student as not enrolled. For example, if the student was enrolled, eligible for uh, the HOPE scholarship and rose out of state, for one year or two years and then return to the state, mm -hmm. it doesn't know that the student was ever enrolled. So uh, we need a user to, to tell the system through a lottery exception that the student has been enrolled at a out-of-state regionally accredited post-secondary institution for at least two years. Uh, and that's not the same scenario as was previously asked in the question. Um, but if a student is in, in is paid one year, not paid the second year, and then come back the third year, uh, the system is calculating it the way that it was that it was previously described. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions. Anything else in the chat, unless somebody wants to you know, unmute and ask a question. Okay, one more question. Um, what type of documentation do we need for these exceptions? Um, I know, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, for Promise, if they're in their graduating semester, we have like a copy of their degree work showing that the, that's all the classes they need, a copy of, I believe, their intent to graduate um, from admissions and records. I can't remember if there's something else or not. What do we use for these? That's going to be up to the institution. I mean, as, as long as you can show that that's all they had left for that semester, then I, uh, that would be sufficient, I would think, for Leah when she comes in. Um, you know, just something showing that's all they had left and and it was their last semester. So in the event the uh, student withdraws from the class after we've paid and then. Uh, and it's not a change of enrollment to from part time to less than part time. And then the student uh, moves the grad date to the end of the next semester. Can we uh, make yet another exception the next semester and having paid the student twice? I'm assuming that's a hope question, Robert. But for promise, I mean, they're still enrolled. They did not graduate. Then, then yes, you would have another possible term if they're not up to the five. But technically, they would drew from their entire semester, so would they technically hope for that term, even though they were only in the one class? So they'd have to appeal, and then could potentially get it paid for the next semester. If they totally withdrew, then yes, they would be they would lose eligibility for enrollment change. Um, and that year will count. For the five year limit. Now that's hope. Yeah, that's hope. Right. Or for promise. Um, if they originally 
are in a term that's before graduation and it's less than full time, then according to these changes, that would not count against their five. So they could potentially appeal, be reinstated, and be paid that another term to finish up. Oh, the wicked web we weave. <laughs> okay, so hope question, similar scenario. They didn't withdraw, but they failed the class. They haven't hit a benchmark, so we'd be able to pay them for that same class, say in fall. They took the one class needed for graduation. They met the exceptions. We paid them. They did not pass it, have not hit a benchmark. We could pay them again for that same class in the spring. Yes. If they haven't reached the five year termination. Five year yet. limit. Yeah. Yeah. Without an appeal since they didn't uh, since they earned the F. Is that true? Yes, true. Yeah, they earned the F for this scenario. <laughs> yeah. Didn't didn't withdraw. We do have a comment. Lisa Shaw asked for hope. Isn't that a change of enrollment? Um, Lisa, under, that, I'm not under that circumstance, the, the question from Dusty, that would not okay. be a change in enrollment because the student earned an F. I think she's talking about my first scenario where I said, or in copying with, I forget who chimed in, where they dropped the class in the semester. That would they be considered the, the change of amount. They dropped a class after census Their, day. My first semester, my first scenario was they only need one class for graduation. They withdraw from the class, or this was somebody else's scenario. That's change of enrollment. So they would be on suspension no and have be, to appeal. No longer be eligible. Right. Right. That's where they would have to appeal to then retake the class the next semester and get hope if still eligible under all other rules. Potentially, yes. So a student would have to uh, be approved for uh, change in enrollment. Yes. Will that count against the five years? Is that is that the question? Waiting on the answer. Uh, so, Robert, I'll, I'll uh, pr proceed with where you were going. So, let's say they uh, they started in the spring. They graduate in May of one year. The following year, under the 16 month rule, they start in spring. And so now they carry forward to a final semester in fall which would be their eighth semester, their five year period. And so I assume that in that scenario, even if they appealed, uh, they've still hit their five year mark. True? Yes, yeah, that's true. So they would hit the five year mark uh, and they were approved, approved for a leave of absence, correct? Yes. OK. Then I can I can work with the institution to back that out, but they would have hit the five year lim limit had it not been uh, for the approved appeal request. Thank you. And uh, and and let me let me just reiterate: the system won't know that, so uh, I would need to be made aware of that, and I can. Um, uh, restore that student's eligibility status. Uh, it will be restored for the entire year. I would I would then respond to the institution, let the institution know that the student status has been updated, but only for one semester, and then proceed with certifying the student as program complete, unless that student uh, enrolls uh, in an advanced degree program and still has a balance of of their five year left. Excellent. Other questions? 
not seeing anything else in chat. Um, James did comment that a FAQ document will be developed and shared in the next few days. We'll also post this in the recording along with the slides to the following website. He added the link in the chat. Um, a fast announcement will also go out with that in it. Unless anybody else has any other questions, we can adjourn. Actually, and, uh, uh, we appreciate it. Oh, we sorry. got one more. Hold on. <laughs> so I may have missed this earlier. I apologize if I did. Um, so can we go ahead and start certifying HOPE or do we need to wait until we get further instruction from you all? Oh, absolutely. You guys can certify HOPE. Uh, if you're asking whether you can certify students with less than six hours, uh, you are not able to do so right now. We haven't until, pushed. OK, OK. We haven't pushed the new changes to the uh, production site yet. But okay. we will soon. Thank you very much. And I, I have, this is, I just have one question. This is Michelle Anderson. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, do we need any kind of appeal for this? Like when they're graduating for less than part time, do we need, does this, do, do we have to have some kind of appeal process in place or any kind of documentation for that? Is this a promise or? Uh, this is a hope related. question. Yeah, if they're oh. like in three hours and they're, they're, they're on their last semester for graduation. Do we need to have any kind of like documentation? For that we we have rules the rule uh is your documentation uh if 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 any of these students are pulled in a sample of course you would want to show that that the student was in, indeed enrolled in fewer than, than six hours mm -hmm. uh but there is no official appeal process needed or an exception needed the rule is okay. the exception that allows you to be able to award a student with fewer than six hours under those three conditions. Okay. Got hey, it. I would. Can you? You can. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I, I was just similar to what I'm. I'm thinking Bill may have covered from a promise perspective. I would just. You. You need the documentation, right? So, whatever procedures or policies you have in place to document that you paid that student correctly, uh, would be the same. The same process that I would use for hope as I would use for promise. Okay. All right. Yes, Thank like you. to Robert's point, you since it's in rule, you can't require the student to appeal, uh, except in the promise perspective. If it's if it's one of those exceptions, it's not covered. Uh, but if it's if it's one of those we've covered in the rule, then you wouldn't appeal. Just document. OK, OK, thank you. minutes left so no questions last chance <laughs> all right i think we're good thank you all for joining um and if you think of a question feel free to email hey hey uh joe we one more one. thing to to reed's question as people start logging off uh yes Read. I would say that this is good to go. As I, I apologize to Joe and Heather before everybody jumped on before I had to leave, we shared this last fall and we were premature. Uh, but the, everything that we've we've just shared has now been approved by the AG, um, and will reconnect is already effective. Promise and hope will be effective in November, but they are administratively effective for the 23-24 academic year. So you can share. Yes. Thanks for asking beginning us with your question. The, yeah, beginning with the fall semester. Yes. Right on. That's it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joe and Bill and Robert. Thank you. Thank you.